All right, so hello and welcome to uh, Pneumatology, to our, our next lecture. I think this is lecture three. And so I uh, want to remind you um, that the very best way for you to listen uh, to these lectures is to listen to them in 15-minute uh, increments. Uh, that way, uh, it really enhances your ability to recall the information, um, keeps you from uh, zoning out or getting bored. So uh, about every 15 minutes or so, um, pause the video, uh, get a get a drink of water, um, you know, go outside with a dog or something. Just give yourself a, you know, a five or 10 minute break and then come back. And because um, obviously um, I want you to retain as as much of this as possible. So here's what we're going to do uh, in this lecture. We're going to discuss the Holy Spirit in uh, the synoptics first which if you recall, the synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because those gospels are, are very similar in their content. And then uh, the gospel of John. So we're going to look at the Holy Spirit and the synoptics in the gospel of John. And then we're going to look at uh, uh, Peter's use of the Holy Spirit in first and second Peter. Um, and that's going to be the, the, the content of our lecture uh, today. And so um, I want to start. So, so last lecture, we talked about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And we talked about uh, the, the word for spirit uh, in the Old Testament is ruach, which could be uh, uh, translated as uh, spirit or breath or wind, depending on the context. So the New Testament was written in Greek and the Greek word, which is translated spirit, uh, breath or wind, just like ruach, is pneuma. Um, so that's the Greek word, and it appears um, over 400 times uh, in the New Testament. Often it is accompanied by an article, uh, the definite article, the, and it is often accompanied by the adjective hagias, which means uh, holy. So um, what you would see in Greek um, many times throughout the New Testament would be the Holy Spirit. Now, the definite article, the adjective, and the word pneuma, right? So, so that's, that's the word that you would be looking for, and even that combination that you'd be looking for, because, you know, you can see other uses of the word spirit in the New Testament and in you know, the, the writings of the, the early church who wrote in Greek, uh, the non-biblical uh, writings or letters, you could see uses of the word pneuma that didn't necessarily refer to the Holy Spirit. So it's a definite article and that adjective that really helps to, to identify um, the Holy Spirit. Um, and then you would look for context as to whether or not the use of the term spirit in other places where you didn't have the definite article um, or you didn't have the adjective, um, you would look for context to let you know whether or not that was talking about the Holy Spirit or not. So let's, let's look at the, let's start with our, our start our lecture by looking at uh, the Holy Spirit in the synoptic gospels. Um, and we're going to look primarily at uh how the synoptics treat the Holy Spirit in the life of John the Baptist and in the life of Jesus. Because the th that seems to be in the synoptics where you'll find um, the, the most use of the Holy Spirit. When I say use of the Holy Spirit, I don't mean use of the divine person of the Holy Spirit. I mean use of the term. And so typically... The synoptic writers, when they were writing about the Holy Spirit, um, they were writing about the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit relates to uh, John the Baptist or Jesus. And very important that you remember all the things we talked about last week or in the last lecture about the, the use of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. To a large degree that operation of the Spirit that existed in the Old Testament 
bleeds over into the New Testament. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when, I, when we talk about the, the use of, of spirit in, um, in the Gospel of John, because that is a much more advanced. John has a much more advanced pneumatology uh, than, than you see. Not that you don't have an advanced pneumatology in the synoptics, but the Gospel of John really has a more advanced pneumatology um, than the synoptics, particularly in how we are to understand uh, the role of the Holy Spirit in the church. So let's look at how the synoptics um, discussed the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of John the Baptist. So the word pneuma first appears in New Testament literature in the Gospel of Mark. Most of us believe that the Gospel of Mark is the oldest gospel, meaning that it was most likely the first gospel that was written. And the very first appearance in the New Testament of the, the word pneuma as it refers to the Holy Spirit is in Mark 1, 7 through 9, when John the Baptist says, um, After me will come one more powerful than I, uh, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So that's really the first time chronologically that we see the use of the Spirit. Uh, Luke 1 15 records that the angel that appeared to Zechariah, and again, we're talking about John the Baptist, Luke 1 15 records that the angel that appeared to Zechariah announcing John's birth stated that he would be, quote, filled with the Holy Spirit even from his birth and that his ministry would be a continuation of Elijah's ministry. So, so this use of Numa in regards to John the Baptist is a continuation of the use of Ruach in the Old Testament, whereby people were filled with the Spirit for acts of service. In John's case, it was a little different. John the Baptist, um, the operation of the Spirit in John the Baptist seems to be the first lifelong feeling that we see. Um, it, it would have been a it would have been a, a somewhat of a special anointing of the Spirit. So, so if that's the case, and I believe that it is. We should understand then that John's ministry and some of his peculiar peculiarities, eating locusts and wild honey, dressed in clothes made of camel's hair, that sort of thing, were spirit-led endeavors, as was his primary ministry as the forerunner to the to the Messiah. So, so really, John the Baptist is a transitional figure. Um, he has the ministry of an Old Testament prophet with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit like a New Testament Christian, if that makes sense. So, so John the Baptist is really a, a bridge. He's the bridge, in, in my opinion, between uh, the Old and the New Covenants. And so, so the synoptics in their treatment of John the Baptist seem to all agree that he was on a spirit-filled mission and he was spirit-led. And so there's a lot of agreement in the synoptics with what you see in the Old Testament or the Old Testament use of Ruach, with the exception that John the Baptist seems to have been the first significant person to have this lifelong indwelling. Because remember, we talked about uh, the last lecture that the spirit in the Old Testament was primarily um, given to people at specific times for specific reasons, uh, specific tasks, things like that. Uh, even Gideon, the the spirit put him on his clothing. He had this idea of being filled, but it was still temporary uh, filling. So, so that's really a summary of what you can expect when you when you go through the synoptics Matthew Mark and Luke and you compile all the the material about the Holy Spirit as it relates to John the Baptist that's sort of the picture that emerges John the Baptist was spirit led had a lifetime indwelling of the spirit from from birth and so that's really the picture that emerges so that's John the Baptist in the synoptics. What about Jesus? How, how is the Holy Spirit, what's the Holy Spirit's relationship with Jesus um, 
from the perspectives of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So when thinking about Jesus's relationship with the Holy Spirit, it's essential that, that and surprise, that, that it's approached from a Trinitarian perspective, right? We're, we're always going to be going back to the Trinity, and I don't think I can say it enough. I, um, I wish that somehow we could change the language, um, the language that, that we use, because we we will say God, right? And we will say Jesus and we will say the Holy Spirit. When we say God, we typically mean God the Father, right? And so I almost wish we would adopt Jesus's language, right? Where Jesus referred to God the Father. And I I, I wish that, because I think we, we muddy the waters somewhat. Um, and I think it's potentially, it could present potential challenges for people um, trying to understand our language because we say um, we believe in God. And um, what we mean is that we believe in, we believe in a, a divine essence that, that presents itself in three distinct persons, God, the father, God, the son, and God, the spirit. So when we're thinking about Jesus's relationship with the spirit, let's think about it from a Trinitarian perspective. And when I say that, what I mean is Jesus is fully divine. And so that, what that means is that Jesus's relationship with the spirit is going to be special. It's going to be different than our relationship. It's going to be different than John the Baptist's relationship. It's going to be different than Gideon's relationship, right? Because Jesus is divine. And so what we're going to do in this lecture when it comes to Jesus and Jesus's relationship and interaction with the spirit is really, really only scratch the surface. This is really just an introduction to, to this study, because I promise you uh, there is a very robust debate um, among theologians about the extent of Jesus's relationship with the spirit. So we're not going to participate in that debate that we're just kind of, kind of introduce um, issues that, um, that we need to consider. So here's the issues that we need to really consider as it relates to Jesus's relationship with the Holy spirit. So number one, uh, Jesus is the incarnate son and the second person of the Trinity. That's where you start, right? If you, if you start any further down, the road on that conversation and you bypass the fact that Jesus is a fully functioning, co-eternal, co-equal member of the Holy Trinity, then you're in danger of misinterpreting Jesus's role with the spirits. That's number one. Number two, the divine and the human nature of the son of God are distinct, but both fully intact. Now, now, you probably know, or you probably have confessed that, that Jesus is God. Jesus is divine. He's fully divine. And no doubt in some of your other classes, you've, you've researched or discussed or discovered that when Jesus was here on earth, Jesus was both fully human and fully divine, right? Now that is quite a mystery. And it it's hard to wrap our brains around because the idea of divinity, the idea of God is so massive that it it's hard to imagine that the fullness of divinity could be housed in flesh. How could, how could this flesh house God, right? But God is God. And so it's a miracle and God is all about miracles. And so, it, but it's important when you're talking about, when you're trying to wrap your mind around what Jesus's relationship to the Holy Spirit was when he had his earthly ministry. Um, so you start with the fact that Jesus was a fully functioning member of the Trinity, but then you say, okay, Jesus was both human and divine, fully human and fully divine. 
And those parts of his nature are distinct. They're both fully intact and they're distinct. So that's the second thing. The third thing you need to really remember when you're addressing this issue about Jesus's role with the Holy Spirit is that Scripture presents the Holy Spirit as playing an active role in the life and ministry of Jesus. It wasn't, um, it wasn't inactive. It was an active role. Next, Scripture presents the Father as playing an active role, right? So you've got the Trinity. The Father plays an active role. The Spirit plays an active role. The Son plays an active role. And here's here's sort of the, the, the final point that you really need to remember when you're trying to wrap your mind around um, the Holy Spirit and Jesus. And that is that Scripture attributes divine agency to the incarnate Son. We already know that, right? And though he had a unique relationship with the Holy Spirit, the Son ministered in the power of his own deity. So there seemed to be, when you read through, and we're going to we're going to cover a little bit of it in just a second, but there seems to be this, this dynamic divine cooperation between the divine Son of God and the human Jesus, right? So you had these dual natures, right? Fully divine, fully human. And there seems to be this, this divine cooperation between the divine son of God and the human part of Jesus, the divine son of God, the son of God, the eternal son of God ministered in the power of his own deity, but the humanity, Jesus's humanity was impacted by led by filled with the divine Holy spirit. And so you had divinity and humanity, the dual nature. In Jesus' divinity, he, he operated and ministered in the power of his own deity. But then there was the human side of Jesus that was filled with and led by the Spirit. So let's, let's break this down a little more. So... As it relates to the Spirit's relationship with Jesus, we can categorize it the following ways, right? So these are uh, four ways we can categorize the Spirit's relationship to Jesus as it's played out in the Synoptic Gospels. So number one, Jesus was a bearer of the Holy Spirit. Um, at his baptism, uh, which is in Matthew 3 and in Luke 3, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus. This was a permanent anointing, and indwelling. It was also a sign of the, the fulfillment of Isaiah 61, which Jesus stood up in the synagogue and read in Luke 4. I'll let you go find that. But the Spirit of God is upon me because he's anointed me to blank, 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 right? So the first thing you need to know about Jesus' relationship with the Spirit as it's reflected in the synoptics is that Jesus was a bearer of the Holy Spirit. Now, as the bearer of the Holy Spirit, that speaks to his dual nature. That's what I was talking about just a minute ago. Obviously, as the second person of the Trinity, the Son did not require spirit anointing because he ministered in the power of his own divinity. But as a forerunner to the ministry of the Spirit in the church, Jesus' human nature required the work of the Spirit to complete his ministry. I want you to think about it as a... Um, I think Phil Wickham has a song called Divine Romance. I want you to think about Jesus's dual nature and his relationship with the spirit as, as, as a, as a divine relationship, this working in divine cooperation, right? So, so the first thing you need to know is that Jesus was a bearer of the Holy Spirit. Number two, the Holy Spirit is an agent in Jesus's ministry. The Holy Spirit led, really drove, if you if you look at that Greek word, drove Jesus into the desert to be tempted. In this instance, we see Jesus under the compulsion of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was an active agent in Jesus's ministry, but this did not negate, negate his divine nature. So the Holy Spirit was an agent in Jesus's ministry. Number three, the Spirit rests on Jesus, but it is not owned by Jesus. It's important to note 
that in the same way that Jesus ministered in the power of his own deity, the Holy Spirit ministered in the power of his own deity and kept his own agency. Um, there's a passage in Mark 6 where Jesus tells of an instance where he says he could not do any miracles because of the people's lack of faith. Where the Spirit couldn't do, where Jesus couldn't do any miracles because of the people's lack of faith. And we can, if you look at that passage in context, I'm not going to read it for, for sake of time, but go back and read that passage. And what we can surmise from this passage is that the Spirit remains distinct from Jesus and is not controlled by him. So that's number three. The Spirit rests on Jesus, but is not owned by Jesus. Number four, the Spirit had a role in Jesus' suffering. According to Hebrews 9, 14, Jesus was able to endure his suffering because of the role of the Spirit in his life. So I know I said a lot there, but I just want to make sure that you get the main points. So when you when you comb through the synoptics and you're looking at how the Spirit operated with and was in relationship with Jesus, there are four major points that really stick out. Number one, Jesus was a bearer of the Holy Spirit. Number two, the Holy Spirit is an agent in Jesus's ministry. Number three, the Spirit rests on Jesus, but is not owned by Jesus. And number four, the Spirit had a role in Jesus's suffering. So it's very interesting to me to think about, you know, how how the divine son of God and the divine Holy spirit operated in such communion with an understanding of each's role, um, operating within almost pre prescribed boundaries, boundaries that existed because of their individual deity. It's very interesting and when I said we're only going to scratch the surface, that's really all we've done is scratch the surface. The, 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 the debates that that exist related you know, to all of these issues is, is fascinating. And I don't mean debates in terms of disagreements, but um, what the church is trying to do and has been trying to do since the first century is get this right. Because it, it is... It's counterintuitive is what it is, because we we don't <laughs> we don't have dual natures like Jesus did. Right. Um, we don't. It's, it's a mystery to us. And it's it's something that's very difficult to to explain. But I, I do think that the very best way to explain it and the best way to frame it is. With this with this language of divine cooperation. It is possible for Jesus to be fully divine and minister in the power of his own deity, while at the very same time being fully human and requiring the work of the Spirit who operates and ministers in the power of his own deity, right? Right? Because we we know that the the it was the it was the human it was the it was the mortality of Jesus the the flesh the humanness of Jesus that that caused him to cry at Lazarus's grave at, or to to sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane or or to to dread the cross I mean that. Well, maybe we'll talk about it sometime, but but crucifixion was was by the time you died from crucifixion, you were glad to be dead. It, just, it was so horrifying and humiliating. So so it was Jesus's flesh that needed the Spirit to get through that. So that's really a a snapshot, almost a snapshot from space, but a snapshot of of how the Spirit is reflected in the life of John the Baptist and in Jesus in the synoptics. All right. So let's leave the synoptics 
And let's look at the spirit in John's gospel, in the gospel of John. Um, John uses a term to refer to the Holy Spirit that is only found in his writings. And it is, it is the, the Greek word parakletos. You find this throughout John, but primarily in those what we call farewell passages where Jesus is saying some last things and, and saying goodbye and, and giving some, some last words in John 14, uh, John's chapter, chapter 14 through 16. So the term parakletos is from two Greek words, para, which means beside, and uh, kalu, or I call, right? Para kaleu. And so literally translated, one called along beside. So parakletos appears four times in the Gospel of John, and the English translation, you find it in various versions, the English translation of Parakletos um, might show up as either comforter or advocate or counselor. So here's some of those. Uh, here's where some of those show up. Let's look at John 14, 15 through 17. I give you another Parakletos. I give you another counselor to be with you. And by the way, when Jesus says, I give you another counselor to be with you, another means another like me, Jesus. So when you read John 14, 15 through 17, what I want you to hear Jesus saying is that I give you another like me. I give you another counselor like me. I give you another parakletos like me to be with you. So it shows up again in John 14, 26, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, John 15, 26 through 27, when the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth. And I'm just, I'm not reading all of these. I'm just reading the, the portions that, that have parakletos. Uh, John 16, 7, unless I go away, the counselor will not come. Now, I want to stop here because I, I, I love talking about this. Jesus looks his disciples in the eye. And he says something radical. Now, remember who Jesus is. We just spent probably more time than we should have talking about Jesus's dual nature. But Jesus was the embodiment of the fullness of divinity, according to Paul. Right. He was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Right. That's that's who he was. He was divinity wrapped in flesh. He was the the. Jesus was the most concrete version of divinity the world had ever seen. The fullness of the Godhead bodily. So Jesus, in John chapter 16, verse 7, looks at his disciples and says, Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. And this is a radical idea because, because Jesus embodied the fullest expression of divinity. It almost makes no sense at all that he would say that. But what he's saying to the disciples is that it's better for you if I go away. Because if I go away, the paraclete will come. So according to Jesus, having the paraclete is better for the church than having the son in the flesh. Now, why is that? Because although Jesus was fully divine, his full humanity was limited. He was limited by the flesh. There were limitations on him that he placed on him by housing divinity in that fleshly body. But the paraclete could exercise the fullness of deity in its ministry to the church. So it's better for you if I go away and the paraclete come because the paraclete won't be bound by the, the rules of this universe, time and space it won't be bound by flesh. And so, so we have these uses of paracletos and I'm going to make a case here for how we should interpret that. Now there are a lot of really smart people on these Bible translation committees 
that spend a lot of time making sure that we have the proper translation, right? It's, it's a hard job and hats off to the people that do it, that spend their entire life studying language so that we can get an accurate translation of the scriptures. But here's one place where I lovingly disagree with all of the Bible translation committees. I don't think we should interpret or translate rather. I don't think we should translate Parakletos as counselor, as comforter, or as advocate. I think we should leave it alone and we should just put the word paraclete in the text, right? So it's it's translated literally, translated literally, one called along beside or one called alongside. So what I think we should do is abandon any attempt to translate it because I don't think that the words counselor, advocate, comforter, I don't think they fully embody what it means. I don't think they fully embody what the word is trying to reflect because until I knew Greek, until I knew what paraclete meant, I did not understand the full the full use of the term counselor or advocate or comforter. I actually had a had a wrong idea about it because I, I learned most of my scriptures in the King James. That's the Bible that we used at the um, the church I went to growing up. And uh, the King James translates in those passages, comforter. Well, the English word comforter, I don't think captures the idea of paraclete. One called along beside. One just like Jesus called along beside. Um, and so... We already do this with words like propitiation and atonement. We leave those passages just like that um, in the text. And then we explain them because it's better that we explain what they mean. And so I really think that's what we should do with Paraclete. But nobody's asking my opinion. So you just have to listen to it. And maybe one day you'll be on a Bible translation committee and you can say, hey, I had a guy in college that thinks we should leave it. So it's up to you now to make that change. But um, so... So John's use of the term paraclete reflects the nature of the Holy Spirit that would interact with, with the church after Jesus' ascension. And parakletos is both descriptive, or it is descriptive of both the, na the, the Spirit's nature and future work. So when you read the word parakletos, what you're reading is a description of, of the Spirit's nature and work. So why is it descriptive of the, of the Spirit's work? Well, it reflects the work of the Spirit in the life of Christians. The Spirit is parakletos because it not only indwells, but it accompanies and proceeds. The Spirit goes before and walks alongside us. Parakletos is descriptive of the Spirit's essential nature because it is omnipresent. The Spirit will never leave. The spirit, the spirit continually goes before and is beside. The Spirit is divine and through its work as paraclete reflects the nature of God and thereby, therefore, reflects the Trinity. So par here's an interesting use of par paracletos that I think you'll like. So in, in um, 1 John 2.1, now we've left the Gospel of John and we've gone to, to one of his letters. In 1 John 2.1, uh, he writes, but if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. In this passage, if you read it in Greek, John is giving Jesus the title paraclete. Now, Jesus gave the title paraclete to the Spirit, and John records that. But later on in John's ministry, he's writing his letters, and he says, he gives, he gives Jesus the title paraclete, and many translations translate that as advocate. We have a, an advocate who speaks to the Father. So there is unity in the Trinity, and there is unity in the ministry of both Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So paraclete appears to be a descriptive title rather than a name John uses exclusively for the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? So 
I don't want you to think that John's use of the term paraclete is the Spirit's name. Paraclete is a descriptive title that Jesus gives to the Spirit and John records. And then John uses that same term to describe Jesus' ministry. So Jesus' actions on our behalf before the Father are actions of a paracletos. So just a bit of clarification there, just so that you know that, that paraclete, which is the English translation of paracletos, uh, paraclete is is not the Spirit's title. It's, it's more of the Spirit's function. It's a descriptive title. All right, so that's the synoptics. That's the Gospel of John. So what about in, in Peter's writings? I thought it was worth tacking this on uh, to the end of this lecture because I couldn't really find a good place for it uh, anywhere else in the in the semester. So let's let's look at what the pneumatology is of Peter as as reflected in first and second Peter. So in these two letters, first and second Peter, Peter mentions the Holy Spirit six times. So he, here are those six times. So in 1 Peter uh, 1 2, the Holy Spirit is the sanctifier. In 1 11, the Holy Spirit in Old Testament saints is referred to as the Spirit of Christ. Peter calls the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament the Spirit of Christ. 1 Peter 1 12, the Spirit empowers gospel preaching. 1 Peter 3 18, Jesus was made alive through the Spirit. And then in 1 Peter 4, 6, men should live in the Spirit rather than in the flesh. So what about in 2 Peter? There's one use of Holy Spirit in uh, Peter's writing, in 2 Peter. And in 121, 2 Peter 121, he says that Scripture came about by the Holy Spirit. So of these six references, the one with perhaps the most theological implications not noted in other uses of Holy Spirit in the New Testament is 2 Peter 1.21. So what this does, what Peter does in, in this brief passage in 2 Peter 1.21 is he establishes the notion that Scripture, the, the source of Scripture, is the Holy Spirit. And here's something very interesting um, to help us understand one of the criticisms that the Christian church gets from people that, that think they know what they're talking about when it comes to the Bible is that we develop, the Christians developed this notion that the Bible was, was divinely inspired later, like it was some later addition to our theology. But that's just not the case. So in 2 Peter 3.16, Paul refers to, I mean, Peter refers to Paul's writings as scripture. Now he he just finished saying in 2 Peter 1.21 that scripture is divinely inspired. It's a it's a work of the Holy Spirit. And then just a what ends up being just a few paragraphs later, if you if you take out all the 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 verse numbering and, and chapter numbering, in 2 Peter 3:16, says that the church regarded the writings of Paul as authoritative and of divine origin and inspiration. So the New Testament writers understood that the apostles' letters were divinely inspired, inspired very specifically by the Spirit. So I hope that what you've been able to glean from this lecture is a, a picture of how the Holy Spirit is approached in the Gospels, in the Synoptic Gospels, particularly in John the Baptist. Um, I'm really hoping that you keyed in on uh, John's use of paraclete. I wish that we had uh, time and I wish we had, uh, I wish we were together so we could discuss it. But there's so much more to John's use of paraclete 
It's it's such deep theology. And um, I was talking to someone a couple of years ago uh, before I started teaching at Elam about why I believed uh, that the Holy Spirit should be considered a member of the Trinity, should be considered divine. And I spent most of my time talking about the paraclete because I think that, that those passages reveal uh, so much about the ministry of the Holy Spirit from Jesus's perspective. And I, I, I think it's so deep theologically. And um, I think that that you could all, you could almost make a career out of out of researching those passages and pulling out the theology, the relevant theology from those passages. So, um, and then we we scratch the surface of Second Peter. Really, the 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 reason I even brought Peter into this was because I wanted to make sure that that at least at some point in this semester we discuss the Holy Spirit's role in in the creation of Scripture. Um, the Holy Spirit is the agent of divinity, and through that agency, uh, inspired these men to write these books and then through the Holy Spirit's own agency, um, protected and preserved uh, these books. So uh, that'll end this lecture. Um, hope you got something out of it. Um, don't forget to send me an email. Let me know that you that you viewed the lecture. If you have any questions, email me or text me, and I look forward to seeing you on the next lecture.